And we're going to start day two uh, in style with a fireside chat. So please welcome Adrian Oye Kami to the stage. Thank you. Scott. Well, please. Well, you certainly nailed my name. Ah, well, I've, I've practiced it <laughs> enough <laughs> times. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, everyone. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, so thank you for joining us today, and I'm so glad I got your name right. And uh, to begin with, why don't you explain who you are? Sure. Why we're we listening to you today? Absolutely. So my name is Adrian Arikami. I am I'm senior vice president for the Radisson Hotel Group. For those that may know the Radisson Hotel Group, we've got multiple brands: the Radisson Blue, Radisson Red. Um, for those of you from London, probably know the Mayfair Hotel here. Um, and uh, I oversee the procurement for that group. I actually have two roles. I'm based in Belgium. And uh, just a little bit of a uh, quick background before I jump to my second role. Uh, I actually started off in the US, uh, on the US side of the business about five years ago in Minneapolis. Um, for those of you who have been to Minneapolis, super cold, but super great city. And, uh, and, and my second role is as the chief operating officer for a company we're just starting called GPP. And GPP is going to serve the procurement sourcing needs of the Radisson Hotel Group, which has about 1,100 hotels globally, and another company, a sister company called the Louvre Hotel Group, which has about 17 hotel, 1,700 hotels globally, uh, it's a Paris headquartered company with a large portfolio in France. So I'm trying to brush up on my Duolingo front French. Um, and, uh, and that company that we're forming, GPP, will be uh, responsible for the procurement of both companies. Okay. Lots of properties there to procure for you. Indeed. All right. Uh, now, this session is entitled Unleashing the Potential for Success. So... In your experience, where's the best place to start? Yeah, you know, I thought it'd be interesting because I'm sure you're all from all very different backgrounds, not just hospitality. And so, you know, I wanted to share my personal experience of transformation because I think we've all, at some point in our careers, been involved in some sort of short-term, long-term planning, three-year plans, five-year plans, 10-year plans sometimes. But um, I, I wanted to share with you my experience um, having worked in the US, having worked in Europe now uh, and in a global role, and been very fortunate to oversee a massive transformation uh, of different companies um, as we've gone through and in the process of doing it as we speak. Um, and so if I just give you, again, a little bit of background. Um, I, when I joined Radisson, it was they're actually called Carlson Residor. And there were two, two, really two companies. It was Carlson, which is a family-owned business that actually owned the enterprise, as it were, based in Minneapolis, headquartered in Minneapolis, and the Residor part of the business uh, headquartered in, in Belgium here. And I actually started on the Carlson side of the business um, and was, again, lucky to come right at the very beginning of that transformation, um, responsible for the Americas, so the US, Latin America, and APAC. And in that, uh, in that structure, we had a very uh, America-centric, if I could say respectfully, uh, organization headquartered in Minneapolis. It made sense because about 1,000 hotels in the US and much less uh, internationally. Um, but, uh, but certainly a, a very strong central core, but very little, if any, local or regional uh, structure in place. Mm. Um, and, and so uh, in, that, in that structure, one of the things that um, in transforming the, in putting together the five-year plan, and I think that's unique here, it wasn't a plan just for procurement, but was really one for the entire organization, and procurement was a very important element of that. And I think um, what, what I wanted to walk you through is a number of elements of that plan. First of all, how uh, for it to be successful, it can't be done in isolation. And so there are many steps that it doesn't matter which business you're overseeing or where it's been overseeing, we all tend to follow the same format. So the first is um, a very honest assessment, let's say, of the current state of affairs. 
and it's not about pointing fingers or, or anything or making anybody look bad or feel bad. It's, it's a, an assessment of where are we today with a view of where you would like to be tomorrow, right? But the first thing is that if you don't acknowledge where you are today, then you can't improve. And so assessment. Then the second part is the strategic choices that are available for you to make. And then the third are the key plan elements that are going to take those strategic choices and put them in action. And then following that, a calendar, et cetera. And we'll maybe get to that later. Um, and so in the US, for example, like I said, a, 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 a unique dynamic. But um, uh, uh, we did a similar plan when my role got expanded uh, globally, and I had to move to, to, to Belgium um, to oversee the, the portfolio globally. Um, and there it was a completely different, different uh, set of uh, factors where you had a sort of a very um, diversified reg regional structure and a much weaker central structure, which brought its own set of dynamics. But at the same time, you're following the same format, assess, make your choices, and then implement, right? If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes, that <laughs> makes perfect sense to me. Um, you mentioned there's some regional variations yeah. as well and some of the challenges working in different geographies. And when you're a global organization like Radisson, what, what kind of variables do you need to take into account when you're trying to implement this plan? Yeah, you know, I was going a little bit there, I guess, in a way, you know, again, just coming from the US, just to repeat a little bit what I said, a very central organization, America centric in Europe, very diversified portfolio. Um, you've got um, cultural issues, you've got uh, language issues, um, and then you've got the perspectives of do you need or do you want to have a different structure that represents um, your stakeholders. What do I mean by that? Um, we have a fairly large portfolio in India. And so back then, it didn't make sense to be procuring products from the US when you know you have a large and, and a good manufacturing base in India. And so you want to build a presence in India, the same thing with China. Um, and so, you know, you have to look at the regional uh, nuances. Um, politics sometimes comes into it as well, so you have to be a little bit careful there as well. Um, but definitely, it, it, uh, understanding uh, what's going on regionally, I think, is, is, is incredibly important. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, building that plan is one thing. There's the well-known phrase about the best laid plans um, often not uh, coming to fruition. How do you align that plan with internal stakeholders? Yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> uh, and I think that, that that's probably one of the, the keys to, to the five-year plan we do. And we call it a five-year plan, but it is a rolling five-year plan. But I think at the very beginning, um, it is absolutely critical to get stakeholders aligned. So for example, I'll, I'll give an example from, from my perspective. Um, my team can do the best contracts in the world, we may believe, but if the hotels don't actually use them, then they don't really mean much. So why would the hotels maybe not use them? Well, maybe they're not meeting the requirements of the different stakeholders for whatever reason. So one of the challenges we faced way back when it was Carlson was um, inconsistent brand standards across the globe. And so Whilst the brand and the brand team, as you would expect, are very creative um, folks, uh, you would expect them to come up with very creative ideas. If, you don't, if you're not part of that conversation right at the very beginning, when they come up with brand standards to implement globally that may in fact not be realistic, you want to make sure that you're part of that discussion very earlier on and you can help guide that discussion understand what their needs are, but also gave them some very good input. So if I give an example of amenities, we used to partner with particular amenity companies or brands, um, but the reality was we could never get those brands across the globe for various different reasons. And so we decided very early on to uh, have our own brand, manufacture it, brand it, etc., so that we could roll it out consistently across the, the globe 
and make the point to our customers or our clients that no matter whether you're in Minneapolis or you're in Shanghai, you are going to get the same amenity, a liquid amenity in your room, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's something you, you, you need to compromise very early on with the brand team, with the operational team, who are no doubt targeted to improve their profitability. And uh, obviously they're looking to procure the items at the cheapest possible uh, price, uh, but the best value. So that's something you have to align with them to say, okay, we're gonna put these products in place. Do they meet your requirements for cost? They're very much part of the process. And then for example, responsible business, right? They, they, they obviously want to make sure that what we are buying uh, meets the requirements from that standpoint. And so making sure that we're all aligned, we're all engaged. There's a lot of compromise. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of arguments, let's say. But at the end of the day, we're all trying to um, uh, make the company better um, and uh, uh, pr you know, do the best job we can. But that is really part of the process. And that process happens right from the very beginning. And then there will be times. The fact of the matter is you won't always agree. And then what we do is we have um, big quarterly meetings with all the leaders. And each leader, by the way, is responsible for their own four-year, five-year plan, procurement, operations, responsible business, etc. cetera. And, uh, and that, at that very long meeting where we're all present, we raise what's called hot topics. And if there are disagreements, then our very talented CEO, Federico Gonzalez, will adjudicate, uh, as it were, and he has a very clear vision of also what he wants, and that way we, we reach a compromise uh, there, uh, or a decision is made, and then we all move forward. So, yes, so that's certainly, it's a very uh, engaged process, but I think a fun process, you know, and I think that's, that for me is what makes it very unique and successful, is that, getting that early engagement, getting that alignment so that you don't have diverging views and diverging agendas, let's say. Everyone's following the same agenda is absolutely critical. So uh, you, you've sort of outlined there how you, how you go about that and, and um, having that engagement. Um, communication is really key yeah. in, in all of this. And obviously you have this five-year plan. How do you communicate that to diverse and geographically um, diverse teams as well. What's the, what's the best advice that you would give when it comes to communicating what you're trying to achieve yeah. and also what are the main challenges in that? Commun you can't communicate enough. Often repeat yourself, keep saying the same thing in different ways. You know, it's interesting. Um, one, of the, one of my learnings uh, in, 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 in the global role is that when you are trying to communicate to folks who uh, come from different backgrounds, but more importantly, speak a different language where English is not their first language, their interpretation of what you say, which whilst it may be crystal clear to you, may be interpreted in many different ways. And so one of the things I often have to remind myself is say the same thing maybe in different ways, and say it often. Um, because that message can uh, get um, translated incorrectly or misinterpreted, and the consequences of that um, can be painful. And so um, for me and the five-year plan, uh, you know, in, in some companies, five-year plans are something that's really secret. It's done in a sort of a dark room and no one sort of knows about it except a few people. Uh, in our company, it's a very open book process. And so um, I just recently had a five-year review yesterday and, uh, and another one last week. And, um, uh, and after the meeting, I come back and I share it with the team. You know, guys, this is what we went through. This is the feedback. This is the things we're going to change. This is the things we're going to adapt, adopt, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I do think that communication is a, an extremely important pillar. And I think sometimes um, as leaders, we can presume that everybody knows what's in our mind, um, but that would often be incorrect. And, uh, and making sure that it filters down in the organization uh, in the right way uh, and in the way you want it, uh, and especially at the very beginning, because transformation, I think one of the things in, in our company culturally is a constant sense of urgency. 
and that at times can be very shocking when you're when maybe that culture is is not what you're used to and so that 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 acceptance of change and that ability to pivot and move quickly um, can be quite jarring at the beginning and so again being able to communicate why things are being done how they're being done how they should be done is again I think in, incredibly important because at the end of the day at least in hospitality we're in the people business so you know we, we, we need to keep our people very motivated and focused on the right thing absolutely now obviously you know even with the best planning in the world you can't guarantee success but what is your key takeaway would you say that people can um, go away with to maximize their chances of success when it comes to this kind of plan and transformation plan for the things you haven't planned for they always happen. So what are you planning for? COVID. <laughs> Not another COVID, I can assure you. Um, no, but yeah, I think in all seriousness, you know, I, I think that exactly as you said, the best laid plans um, never go quite according to plan. But I would say that um, learn quickly. Uh, be able to adapt. Be able to pivot. I think are key ingredients. Build resilience you know, um, and I think just set that expectation that things won't happen exactly the way you want. Hopefully you'll continue going in the right direction. And the fact of the matter is, you know, as I said, there are key plan elements and of those key plan elements, we have very detailed calendars on the execution and, and everything sort of, you know, hopefully going like clockwork, it never does, but that's the plan, right? But always have a plan B and a plan C, you know? And I think for those things, when you, when you see something isn't working, I mean, you have two choices. E either acknowledge it's, well, acknowledge it's not working, either do something about it to try and fix it or kill it and move on to the next thing, right? But what you don't wanna do is pretend it's not working um, and, and keep doing the same thing but expecting a different, a different outcome. So, you know, I think those are, those are, are, are really key. And, and also expect that, um, you know, a lot of the initiatives take, take capital, take uh, investments, and things change, you know, that are sometimes, quote unquote, out of your control. And so, for example, when COVID, I mean, we all went through COVID, hospitality was absolutely, you know, uh, we went through a really tough time. And so you, you can't expect that whatever investment you had planned to do at that point in time was going to happen. So you, you pivot and, and then you try and adapt. And now we're out of COVID, dust off those old plans again, see if they're relevant and then keep moving. You know? Would you say that your plans and, and your strategy changed during or post COVID? Because you've talked a lot about flexibility and being able to pivot and you know, um, taking some of those knocks and making quick decisions. Is that, was that your approach before COVID or has your outlook changed because of that and has that actually been a good thing when it comes to future planning? Absolutely. I, I don't think any of us, at least I couldn't have imagined that so many of our hotels would actually be closed, you know? And so that, that's a scenario that even with planning, you don't plan for, at least before. And I think post that, we've come out a lot smarter um, I think all these challenges make us better. And so, yes, absolutely. We have um, our planning for plan B is a lot more robust. Uh, our plans have definitely changed post than they were before, but that's a good thing. They changed um, to make us adapt quicker during the downturn, and that has served us very well in the upturn. So some of the things that maybe weren't in the plan originally that have made us sort of leaner, meaner and stronger have served us very well coming out of the downturn as well. And we've kept those in place. We have certainly continued to accelerate our IT transformation um, that I think managed to stay, you know, by and large, um, very much in place because that forms a foundation uh, of what we're trying to do in, in, in across the company. And I, th I think by and large, we continued investment, investing in certain areas, even during the downturn. And again, that has propelled us uh, ahead as we've, as we've come out uh, of that. So yes, I think you have to learn uh, and hopefully we all become smarter from that. 
I hope we do, and I think we've all become a little bit smarter listening to your conversation <laughs> today. So thank you so much, Adrian Oyekami. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Adrian. Thank you.